Well, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Phoebe, to talk, to, um, talk about th this community and about some of these wonderful postcards in this collection. I'm a huge fan of this, uh, of this project um, and, uh, and of, the, of the Falmouth Public Libraries, really, of what they've been doing over the, over the years uh, to help uh, promote uh, some of these community histories that we have. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I'll be talking a little bit about some of this today, but um, uh, if you want to take a deeper look at some of these, uh, there's a whole series that I, that I did for Falmouth Public Library's Joy of Learning about uh, Portuguese community history. I'm going to try and not repeat anything that I, that I said in any of those and try and come, come up with today with all brand new things that I haven't talked about before in some of these, uh, with some of these great postcards that, uh, that you have. But um, yeah, as you say, um, some of the postcards and most of the postcards that people um, are, are, are talking about are representative of specific communities are, are represented by uh, specific communities in some of the images. And um, when I got invited to do this project or to, to do this interview, I, um, I went through the whole collection, just beginning to end, and tried to find some of, some of those, what are those postcards about, about uh, the Portuguese and Cape Verdean communities in Falmouth. And I found that there weren't really a whole lot, you know. Um, there's a, a f um, one postcard of St. Anthony's Church, uh, which is a, uh, was a Cape Verdean or is a Cape Verdean uh, fa Portuguese uh, community-founded uh, church. Um, but, um, but aside from that, you, you, there, there really isn't a whole lot. Um, if you look at a, a, one of the postcards of, of Main Street, for example, um, what you don't see in this postcard, it's this, this one is um, if, actually if I have one complaint with uh, the uh, the postcard project, it's that there aren't really a great dates on the postcards. I don't know if that's something you're trying to. Uh, yeah, they they mostly aren't dated unless they were mailed and have a postmark on them. Um, so we can really only ballpark it by the styles of cars and that kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah, well, you need to maybe crowdsource this because I'm sure there's people in town that uh, can take one look at this and and uh, you know know exactly what, where it was and, and when it was photographed. But th this, this image, you can see in the background here, um, an image of what was the old East Falmouth Village School. And um, you know, what you don't see to the sides of this are the Portuguese farms and the Cape Verdean farms that were interspersed around and about um, some of these buildings as you, as you go down Main Street and some of the other postcards also of, uh, of T-Ticket. Um, they, they are kind of in the margins and not really, not really quite seen. Um, and, and this is interesting. The, most of the Portuguese were, were, came here to work as uh, farmers, and the one, the one kind of farming photo that you are, or a postcard that, that we have is the, of the Cunha Ranch, which was an important uh, large agricultural farm um, that employed a, a great number of workers, many of them Portuguese, um, as it turns out. Um, as happened in many cases, though, when the Portuguese and Cape Verdeans were um, working on farms for others, they decided to be much easier and better for themselves to start their own farms, uh, which they did, uh, growing uh, the most famous crop in Falmouth of this community is, of course, um, uh, the, the crop of strawberries, uh, but this was not limited to strawberries. They grew yams, they grew blueberries, they grew all kinds of other, um, all kinds of other, um, uh, other things, as well as doing other, other kinds of work in town as well, um, in Woods Hole, but also around uh, the rest of town. Um, they ended up moving into the eastern, what was then euphemistically called the eastern part of town, uh, which was this kind of area of East Falmouth and further over into a tea ticket towards the Kunamesa River uh, that was largely abandoned farmland. Nobody really wanted it. Um, nobody wanted to live there. There wasn't really a lot going on. And so these communities moved into these, uh, uh, started farmsteads in, 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 some of these, um, in, in some of these plots of land that they had bought, uh, built houses. Um, and you know, you can see here again that you've got this great image of Kuna Mesut Farm, not a lot of postcards of some of these other places. Um, this isn't necessarily a nefarious intent, uh, it's just that these communities were, uh, were largely invisible, I think, to a lot of the people that were coming. And also, why are people buying postcards? You're buying a postcard because you visited a, a special, unique, beautiful place and you want to write home to someone and tell them, you know, all about this, this fantastic place that you've seen. And, um, you know, East Falmouth and these areas, they didn't have a lot of tourist attractions in them, you know. Um, so they had, uh, it, it was um, an area that, that was largely relegated to the people that lived there and the farmers that lived there, most of them uh, immigrants, but some other people that also owned other cranberry bogs, for example, and um, which many Portuguese and Cape Verdeans worked at and actually also owned a number of cranberry bogs as well. Uh, but you don't really get to see some of these um, in, 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 in the postcards. Um, 
uh, although uh, on, this, on the sides of the postcards are all of these, are all of these communities. Um, the one postcard that we really have of, um, of a prominent Portuguese institution, community institution, uh, is of St. Anthony's Roman Catholic Church uh, in East Falmouth. And um, this uh, Catholic church was built uh, in the 1920s. Uh, it's f famed, um, everyone, or most people know the story of the, 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 the church that Strawberries built, uh, as, it's, as it's been called, um, with members of the Portuguese and Cape Verdean community tithing uh, parts of their, their strawberry um, profits to give to the building of this church. Um, what's lesser known are the many, many other community buildings um, that didn't get postcards, most of them much older, uh, including, for example, um, the, many, the, the, Saint, uh, the Holy Ghost Halls that the town had. One of these uh, still stands today. It's the St. Anthony's Club uh, on Brick Hill Road. Um, this was a building that also served as an important community center, um, as well as the, the actual hall itself that got moved next to the church. Um, and um, has since, I believe, been uh, re, uh, re reconstructed, but it was um, originally also a Holy Ghost Hall. And then, of course, there's a, a Falmouth's most well-known Holy Ghost Hall, which is the, um, uh, the Fresh Pond Holy Ghost Society on, um, on Carrot Shop Road. And this is a building also that um, you know, was a, a very prominent community center. Um, they had, there were political meetings at these, some of these places. Um, they had senators coming down, uh, US, US senators coming down, governors coming down to, talk to, um, to give talks and, and these kinds of things. Uh, it's where a lot of the Mass Agricultural uh, College um, uh, scientists would come to talk to the Portuguese community as a result of people like Bertrand Tomlinson, uh, who brought them in to try and help found a strawberry crop yield and uh, protect it against various blights that, uh, that, the, that the crop often, oftentimes had to face. Um, so St. Anthony's Church, of course, a very important uh, central, central cultural institution. Uh, but again, there's all these other, other places that would have, would have made great, great postcards. If I was visiting Falmouth, I would have loved to have written a postcard home, if I wasn't from Falmouth, of course, uh, of, the, of the Holy Ghost, uh, one of the Holy Ghost halls uh, in town. It's not too late. Uh, anybody wants to make a postcard, they're still there. So um, we also have, um, the back of this card is actually something I'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, you know, on the, on the card it says that, you know, the St. Anthony's Roman Catholic Church, East Falmouth, and then it says, uh, a Portuguese national church, which contains a famous painting of Our Lady of Fatima. So um, anyone who's ever been inside of, um, of uh, St. Anthony's Church knows of this, of this well-known, uh, beautiful painting of the Virgin of Fatima. Um, there's a great story behind this, uh, which I'd like to tell a little bit of if I can, um, with, uh, while looking at this, uh, at, this, at this postcard of the church. Um, unfortunately, there's no postcard actually of the, the, the uh, Nossa Senhora de Fatima, but you'll have to stop by the church sometime to take a look at it if you're, uh, if you're curious. Um, but what's interesting about this is that it, it, it says right off the bat that this is a Portuguese national church, and this was an interesting kind of a, a, a political arrangement that this church had. So most churches are arranged as parishes, as where you live in a certain geography and you go to that church because uh, you, uh, you live in that, in that, uh, in that parish, that, that geographic parish, territorial parish. And in the case of St. Anthony's Church, um, this was not um, how people belonged. You belonged to it if you were Portuguese. So um, this is something that many of us have known in town uh, for a long time, especially those of us who you know, were baptized and had first communion and confirmation in St. Anthony's Church as I did. And um, you know, um, it's a place that um, um, was always known as a, a, a Portuguese church. And uh, what's interesting about this is that this and the painting itself was part of a broader um, uh, effort on the part of Portugal's Estado Novo dictatorship, uh, uh, fascist dictatorship, to promote uh, cultural diplomacy uh, in the United States by relying on working with immigrant communities in order to gain political advantage in the places where they were. Um, this doesn't mean that the people, um, you know, some people were actively involved in this, uh, consciously uh, involved in this. The vast majority of Portuguese in New England, of course, had no idea this was going on. Um, you know, they were just participating in, in um, you know, in these power processes that really didn't have anything to do with their conscious awareness of what they, what they were participating in. Certainly, uh, you know, the case of the, of, of the parishioners of uh, St. Anthony's, uh, Anthony's Church. But um, some of the operatives that were working on this um, was a, a good friend of the parish uh, priest 
at, in, at the time of, um, uh, in, in the 40s, uh, uh, Father Avila, no relationship to the current uh, Father Avila, that uh, Steve Avila, that's now the, uh, the, parishioner, the, um, the, the priest of, uh, of the church. But uh, Father Avila uh, was involved, was good friends with someone named um, Ab Abacassis, who was one of um, the individuals involved in trying to create some of these cultural diplomacy efforts. And what they were doing was, one of the things that they did was to try and send artists and, um, and, and literary people into communities in the U.S. where they could become friends with some high, high-level people. One of the people that they sent to, to do this was a man named Henrik Medina. Henrik Medina was the painter of the Virgin of Fatima uh, a painting at St. Anthony's Church. Now, Henrik Medina was a, a well-known, um, he was born in uh, 1900, uh, 1901, something like that, uh, died in 1988, but he was a, a well-known portraitist and a portrait artist. And one of his activities um, working on behalf of the Portuguese Estado Novo was to try and get a film made in Hollywood about the Virgin of Fatima. So the Virgin of Fatima was this apparition of the, the, of the Virgin Mary to these three uh, pastor children in a field in Fatima, Portugal. Um, there's a huge uh, 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 cathedral and shrine built to this, um, to this apparition. And um, in, in, in any case, um, the, the painting was designed um, for, it was, it was painted so that it could appear as a promo for the, the making of the film. So the painting was made ahead of trying to promote the film or get the film made. Uh, the film eventually did get made, but not for many, many years later. But while Enrique Medina was, uh, was in Hollywood, he actually was asked to paint the uh, famous uh, uh, painting in um, the picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, this film that, that, was, that was made, I think it came out in the 30s or, or for, for 40s, I think it was like 45 or so. Um, that, this, that this film came out of um, Hunt, was I believe the actor. His, his painting was the before picture, not the after picture um, of Dorian Gray, but because um, he was a, a, a skilled and gifted portraitist. Um, but you can look it up online and see Henrik Medina's uh, picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, but in any case, um, I was in an, an, an alphabetista in, um, in Lisbon, an alphabetista is one of these old, ancient uh, used bookstores where you can find things that go back, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, and uh, you know, if you're if you're looking carefully, and I came across a silkscreened print of the Virgin of Fatima, this painting by Enrique Medina that's had, that you know hung in this church that I went to every Sunday since I was a little kid. And um, uh, I was astonished that this was there, and I looked at it, excited to see. Uh, whenever I'm in Portugal, I like to run into people from Falmouth or see things from Falmouth. So I got very excited to read St. Anthony's Church, Falmouth Mass. When I read where it was, it was in a church in California. Um, and I was very surprised by this because the story that I had always heard about this painting was that Father Avila had it commissioned directly from uh, Enrique Medina. As it turns out, not really quite the case. Um, once the painting was made, it was actually given to a Portuguese church, another Portuguese national church in California. Um, and, uh, and then eventually when um, when uh, Father Avila was looking for this painting uh, and trying to find one, he ended up getting the painting that had already been made and, and, was, and was brought to him from, um, you know, from, from California. So um, it's a, kind of a, an interesting story about how this painting got to this, got to this church. Um, and more interesting even for my own work and research is how these kinds of, uh, of activities promoted the sense of the Portuguese community here. I mean, this is a very famous painting. People are very proud of this painting also in, in, in town. And, um, it, it also speaks to how sometimes how um, the reasons for something creating a community is not necessarily as important as the creation of the community itself. Um, that the creation of the community has a life of its own beyond sometimes beyond beyond the, the actions of others to uh, you know to try and create uh, this these efforts to help the Estado Novo and, and in the end maybe maybe didn't didn't quite quite do what they what they wanted to set out and wanted to do. Um, but everybody should go to take a look at that. Uh, go to a mass sometime at uh, St. Anthony's Church, and, and you can see the, the painting hanging above the altar. It's really a, a really a masterwork, a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of piece of art. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about uh, when we talk about the Portuguese communities also is um, th there are a, a number of mythologies that get uh, spoken about, um, saying that Portuguese and Cape Verdeans weren't very politically active, um, and uh, there's a, a great. Um, a, a postcard here of the, um, the what's now the school administration building uh, that got built in, I believe, 1920s, uh, I want to say 1927, um, but it, it was thereabouts. Uh, after the old um, uh, Titicket Village School burned down 
uh, then was briefly rebuilt. If I'm not mistaken, it's where the VFW Hall is now. Um, uh, you also have um, a postcard of the old village, uh, T-Ticket Village School as well. Um, but um, I, I bring this up, this postcard up, because when Portuguese and Cape Verdeans started to get politically active, uh, it's really interesting. Um, another very important community institution that I haven't mentioned are some of the other clubs. Uh, in fact, one of the oldest in Falmouth, the oldest uh, civic and immigrant civic club, is the Cape Verdean Club of Falmouth. Um, this actually started off as a, as a uh, political club. Uh, where they used to have uh, meetings at Frank Rose's Barbershop on Sandwich Road. There isn't a postcard of that either. Um, uh, and, um, and then eventually they moved their meetings, uh, bi-weekly me or bi-monthly meetings rather, to the, the school administration building where they held them uh, from the 30s. Uh, they also sponsored candidates night. Sometimes they would hold them in some of the other Portuguese community halls like St. Anthony's Club. Um, sometimes they would hold them at the, uh, the T-Ticket building. Eventually they built their own club um, starting in 1941 changed the name of the political organization. It was all the same people that were, that were the, the board members, but they just rechanged the name to a, um, to a civic club, a club, which is a Falmouth Cape Verdean Club, another extraordinary Falmouth uh, institution um, that still is going quite strong uh, today and has a great, a great number of, uh, of wonderful activities. That's on Sandwich Road as well. So um, why did they start getting involved? Why, why the school, um, you know, the school administration building? Well, it was very difficult for Portuguese people and Cape Verdean people uh, to get elected to office town-wide. People wouldn't vote for them. However, school districts were based on geography and they were smaller. So the very first successful political campaigns that were uh, waged and won by, um, by Portuguese were first in the school board. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a great postcard to kind of to bring that all home. Also, it's because it, it's located really at, at the kind of the crux of, of what's a major thoroughfare of the Portuguese community. So you have, um, you know, Route 28 or Davis Straits turning into Route 28 and going off towards through T-Ticket and then into East Falmouth. And then you have Sandwich Road shooting up to Hatchville. Um, and um, both of these streets were lined with Portuguese and Cape Verdean farms, uh, uh, strawberry farms mostly. As you got further in, there were cranberry bogs where many Cape Verdeans and Azorians especially uh, were working um, on those cranberry bogs. Um, as you got further out, um, you know, towards Wakoit, you also had some uh, Cape Verdean owned uh, uh, cranberry bogs and Portuguese owned cranberry bogs. But um, you know, this, this school administration building is really kind of in the, in the smack in the middle of where the Portuguese community started to really grow and um, it's almost a, a monument to that, that community in some ways. I also feel fondly about it because my mother uh, also worked uh, when she was a, a young, she was the salutorian of, of Falmouth High School. There were, I think, limited opportunities for young Portuguese American girls at that point to go to, go to university, uh, which she certainly would have done if she was born in my generation. Um, but she became a, a secretary in the school admin building. Um, so my mother worked at this building um, you know, for, for many years. I don't know if there's one of of, of, the, um, of the, uh, uh, the fire department. But if you had one, uh, you could show that now because that's where my, my dad worked for, uh, for his whole life. Um, he passed away in 2017, but, uh, but he, was, he was a fireman there for, for his life and also was a, uh, was a captain. Um, I, I would also bring up some of the other political activities that took place with some of these communities by looking here at um, Terrace Gables. Um, what Terrace Gables and the Heights has to do with the Portuguese community is kind of another small little story that, um, that doesn't really get talked about a lot, but um, uh, there were two, a couple of really important uh, civic organizations in Falmouth that, that arose out of the movement to Americanize the immigrant, which was this post-1920s progressivist movement. Uh, and the idea was that um, immigrants in America were not suitable for citizenship. This was the, uh, the arguments from, um, from, from certain um, quarters that they, uh, immigrants d d shouldn't be uh, allowed to have citizenship because they were mentally, uh, psychologically inferior and uh, they weren't civic-minded people. And so uh, the movement to Americanize the immigrant was a progressivist movement that uh, certainly had its, uh, its problems, uh, most definitely, um, in its definitions of what it meant to be an American and what it meant to belong to a community. Uh, but what they promoted was effectively um, uh, education classes and civics, um, teaching people how to participate in political, political processes, teaching them English, uh, these kinds of uh, activities. Um, and there were two organizations in town that were deeply involved in this. Uh, one was an organization called the Portuguese Fraternity, 
which was a uh, insurance uh, uh, scheme, like these be bene beneficent societies that were very common in the 20s. There was no personal insurance. There was no uh, workman's comp, right? Um, so you would belong to these insurance schemes that would help you to pay in uh, every week, and then you would get, get a, if you were sick or, or, heaven forbid, you died, you would have money for a funeral, um, or you would have money to, to pay for your you know, convalescence uh, while you got better. So um, one of the more prominent in um, not only New England but in the, uh, the United States was one called the Portuguese Fraternity. They had branches, uh, there were over 40 branches in its heyday, 40 or 50 branches in its heyday. Um, and they um, had an annual retreat every year. And in 1926, they held their annual uh, retreat with all their new officers, the national officers, at Terrace Gables in Falmouth. Um, and there's a wonderful uh, article written in the Enterprise, uh, another great initiative of Falmouth Public Library that everybody should check out is the Enterprise Digitization Archives. And um, you know this this archive is uh, uh, has some really rich stuff in it. And one of the they they have a great description of this event. Um, and in it, the Enterprise actually translated from Portuguese and into English, and then printed this in 1926 in the Falmouth Enterprise, an article uh, describing, the, um, describing this event and the really beautiful way that people, uh, the, the author described Falmouth, um, sort of saying it was no doubt that people from the Azores were so interested in, in this beautiful place um, that was on the ocean, and, and how could it not help but you know, remind them of home. Um, so this was, uh, this was uh, I thought, a, um, a, there's, a, there's a couple of great postcards you have in the collection from Terrace Gables. Uh, this, of course, was a, a tourist attraction, which is why there's a, a, a couple of great postcards about it. Um, but it wasn't just tourists going there. Obviously, this was a place that, um, that, that other people in the community were using and, and relying on. And in this case, uh, the Portuguese fraternity um, you know, had, had this great meetings there. Uh, another one that I mentioned is the Portuguese American Civic League that also uh, was another organization, civic-minded organization, highly involved. Um, and they did a number of activities at the Lawrence High School, which you have uh, also some great, uh, some great images of. So these were sort of some of the, you know, there was a spread of the, you know, we, we sometimes, I think, think about uh, Portuguese history, Cape Verdean history, as if um, that's something apart from or separate from Falmouth history, but it's not, you know, it's, um, this is, this, this is uh, Cape Verdean and Portuguese history, is, it is Falmouth history. So, um, and the people that, that belonged to these communities were not limited to these, you know, to their churches and their social clubs. Um, they were people that had a reach throughout town, that participated in many organizations throughout town, um, that were veterans of foreign wars and, um, you know, that, uh, that also lived in many other places uh, all, all over town. Um, Hatchville was kind of at the outskirts of a lot of these Portuguese, um, the Portuguese farming. There were a great number of Portuguese farms in Hatchville um, spreading off towards North Falmouth as well. Um, but they bumped up against uh, some of the, 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 um, uh, the non-Portuguese or the, the WASP, I guess, um, 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 Falmouth uh, resident. Uh, farms and um, personally, um, I grew up. Um, I, I, I did the math once, and I, I did all the. I kind of measured it all out and found out that I was almost equidistant where I grew up on. I grew up on Turner Road um, from all of the main Portuguese clubs, like the Portuguese American Association, from uh, the Holy Ghost uh, Feast, from the Cape Verdean Club, from St. Anthony's Church. So, um, but I was uh, I was equidistant, but I was kind of a little bit removed from them. Um, where I was on Turner Road. Now, I, my family, um, there's a, a great house. Actually, just my, my, uh, the house that my grandparents had their farm in uh, was uh, a home right on the corner of John Parker Road and, uh, and Sandwich Road. It actually just got bought uh, recently. I'm, I, 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 it's a, it's a, it gonna be a great tragedy. Um, one of the other things that, that happens is a lot of these old Portuguese farmsteads, because they're not in wealthier parts of town or in West Falmouth, they don't get historical recognition the way that some of the other houses do. Uh, many of the, these old Portuguese farmsteads are older than some of these other places have, you know, I don't want to say they have richer histories, every family history is beautiful and important, but, you know, they have, they have histories that are important to the town's, you know, uh, economic life and, 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 and community life as well. And, um, you know, they will get torn down. So this old, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, beautiful 1800 far 1800s farmstead um, that, you know, was then purchased by my, uh, by my family when they came to America, and then used as, a, uh, as their base for their farm, um, uh, which had land all across along uh, Turner Road. Uh, and then as each of one of their kids got married, they just built a house on, you know, on the farmland. Uh, and there was five of them, and you know, this is a very typical Falmouth story. You know, I, know, I know tons of family. Uh, I was talking to, uh, to Mary Bishop, who's a, a great Falmouth resident, uh, and she uh, was telling me how a very similar thing happened to her family on Trotting Park Road. 
Um, and this is a very typical story that, that people tell. Um, I, growing up in a place like that was, very, was not strange for me. I think it was strange anytime I, I talked to people not from Falmouth about it uh, or not from you know, these Portuguese communities about it. Um, but you know, I had all my cousins and aunts and uncles all in one street. Um, and then eventually my grandparents left that house and moved, moved across the street. Um, you know, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we had this great life there and it was a very family oriented and very fun. Um, I mean, at the time, I think I probably was, I felt a little uh, restricted by it, of course. Um, you know, you couldn't like leave the house without 20 relatives seeing everything that you were doing, um, which made some of my, you know, the fun activities that I might have done uh, a, little, a little more difficult to pull off. But um, my sister didn't seem to have any problems with it. Uh, you know, she, she uh, but, but this is always the case. The, the younger sibling always gets away with a lot more than the older one does. Um, so, but anyway, uh, you know, growing up on, on in, this, in this area, my family also, um, you know, we were, I went to uh, the school district that I belonged to was not the Portuguese, the school where all the Portuguese, where most of the Portuguese residents went, which was like T-Ticket School or East Falmouth School. I went to North Falmouth. And um, this was, you know, it was interesting because there weren't a lot of, there were a couple, but there weren't a lot of Portuguese kids at North Falmouth School. And um, I, don't, I don't really think I ever had a sense of myself as, as, you know, being different until I went to North Falmouth School. Not, in a, not necessarily in a bad way, I didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't feel like I was left out of anything, but I just, I, I got a real sense of like, that I was, oh yeah, I'm really from this Portuguese part of town, that's a, that's a really different part of town than, this, than North Falmouth and West Falmouth. Um, and, and, and anyway, it was, it was something that I was made very aware of as a result of um, being kind of on these borders. Um, but also, you know, quite interesting as well, because it, it, I think that it allowed me a facility to kind of move between some of these different worlds. Um, uh, a lot more fluidly um, as, as a result. But anyway, um, I, I spent most of my days as a young kid on the old Silver Beach in the summers, um, which was, you know, in, in, that, part of, in that part of town. Um, my father was a real avid uh, beachgoer, in fact. Uh, speaking of postcards, um, there's a really famous, like it's, I think, one of the most famous postcards in the world if you are over a certain age. It's the famous Where the Boys Are postcard uh, of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it, it was a, a, a postcard that, came out right after the film. And um, as many people did who saw that film, uh, they immediately went down to Florida to, um, you know, to, go, um, to go, go to the beach and go to Fort Lauderdale and, and these kinds of things. Um, my f uh, father's family actually would go, would go down there before, uh, during this time period in the winters, they worked construction and were, um, you know, were, uh, were people that um, you can't really dig in the ground when it's freezing out. So they would sometimes go, uh, to, they would go to Florida um, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and get away from the, the cold. Uh, but um, my father is on, he's, in, he's the, the biggest pick person on, the, on this really famous postcard. Um, and he sticks out like a sore thumb, the poor thing. He was a huge, uh, he loved going to the beach, but in the picture, uh, he, he got a little bit of a sun exposure. And so he's in, a, in this jacket, like zipped up. And he was very embarrassed about this for, the, for his entire life being, you know, zipped up in this jacket. And this really famous postcard that's all over, you know, all over. All, <laughs> okay. I'm sure that, uh, that if, any, if anyone had a relative that went to Florida, you know, uh, in Falmouth from, you know, basically up through the 90s, uh, they, they, got, they got this postcard sent to them by, by someone at some point. Uh, anyway, uh, so there's Old Silver Beach. My first job also, actually that's not true, my first job um, was working as a, uh, a hawker for the Falmouth Enterprise. Um, they, um, Bill Huff um, was, uh, was then the editor-in-chief and um, they needed someone to walk around selling the road race supplement on road race weekend. So he hired me to, um, I think I got like four cents a newspaper. And um, I just went around just selling because they had the, the edition had the program to the, uh, with all the, uh, the runners in the road race and other little interviews and, and tidbits and what have you. So yeah, so uh, I would just take these things and they would, um, you know, I, I sold them all over, uh, all over road race weekend and then I sold them also in town. Um, walking down Gifford Street uh, at the, in front of the hospital uh, extension and stopping traffic. And eventually, Mr. Griffin, who was my social studies teacher uh, at uh, Lawrence Junior High School, he, uh, they, they stopped me and, and said I couldn't walk down in the traffic anymore. And, and eventually, they, they had to stop the program because it was um, obviously a horrible, you know, a horribly dangerous hazard. But, you know, those were the days. Um, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, we, uh, uh, my first real job, though, uh, real proper job, was working at the Seacrest. Uh, in Falmouth, and the Seacrest is a really famed place. There's a great postcard here of the uh, Seacrest Hotel, um, with a couple of images, uh, and this is this is actually an image of the old one of the old the older version of the uh, of the hotel um, 
um, it's it's a place that that really has a, a great fame. I mean, um, originally there was a, a theater there with uh, Jimmy Jimmy Stewart, I think, was part of this, and, and Henry Fonda, um, Margaret Sullivan, also. And then after that, it was uh, the site of a, a music club called the Latin Quarter, which was uh, run by Lou Walters, who was Barbara Walters' father. Um, and then eventually, um, it was it was uh, bought and purchased, and, and tried. They tried to turn it into a kind of a you know, like the Cape Cod or some of these other places, uh, some of these other big resorts, um, creating a, uh, you know, creating a seaside resort in Falmouth. And this was during this large uh, push, uh, you know, in the 40s and 50s when, they, when, when Falmouth really started turning towards a tourist economy and they really tried to promote Falmouth as a place for tourism. Um, and um, eventually it was bought in 1971, and this is who I worked for, by um, Red Auerbach, who was the, the you know the great coach of the uh, of the Boston Celtics and a later general manager, um, um, uh, Mr. Battles? Uh, his, I think his, I always called him Mr. Battles. I think his name was Ken Battles, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, Steve Hill, who um, who was a, an incredible uh, incredible person. He was just this, he was an entertainer, a performer. And um, what they really did was they tried to create almost like a, like a Catskills at uh, at the Seacrest, and um, you know. There, there were a lot of um, uh, Jewish families that would come down for uh, for holiday. Uh, they had mahjong tournaments, um, you know, where the whole place was just filled with um, with um, uh, Jewish women playing mahjong. It was just uh, a lot of fun, and um, I, I literally had every job at this place. I worked as a uh, I, I pre predominantly I worked as a, a waiter and a um, and a, um, a, a busboy. But I worked, you know, I also worked in the kitchen. I worked on the line sometimes. They'd hire me. They'd, I, was in the, I was in the pantry. I was a bellboy. Um, I, did, I did so many things at this place. I, um, you know, I, I once waited on a Sid Caesar, actually, uh, was, uh, was a guest there uh, sometimes. Um, and, I, and I waited on him a couple times. Great tipper, by the way. Um, and, um, but one thing that they asked me to do, um, this is when uh, St Steve Hill died uh, shortly after. I was only there for a couple years before, uh, before Steve uh, passed away. Um, but he had he created this place that was an incredible venue for live music and entertainment. Uh, so they would have nightclub shows all the time with comedians and you know like uh, uh, bands like the uh, the Drifters played there and you know these kind of older bands that that um, uh, th that were very popular at the time um, would would come through and play in Falmouth. And um, they would hire me every every night or on the weekends to work the spotlight. So I would like. You know, I was a young kid, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. I worked there from like 14 to 17 or 18. And, um, you know, it just uh, was, was quite an eye-opening experience for this young, you know, Portuguese Catholic boy from a pretty strict family, Catholic uh, family, uh, Portuguese Catholic family, to, um, you know, to be put into this world of, uh, of, of you know, entertainment. And, um, you know, S Steve Hill had some really crazy parties that we would be sometimes asked to work. Um, and it was a real eye-opening experience for a uh, you know for a young man to um, uh, to see this kind of world and possibilities. And also, the Seacrest had so many people from all over that were working there as well. You had a lot of people coming down over the summers uh, from outside of Boston and New York and other places. You had a lot of people from Bourne working there. Uh, again, like these kind of different communities of people all coming together. And it was a great experience to work there and and kind of. Um, uh, uh, kind of come together with all of these people, and it re really changed me as a, a person. I think um, I, I, I won't say his name, but a, um, uh, you know, there's a um, a, um, a law enforcement officer, let's just say on Cape Cod uh, somewhere, who was uh, um, who was a, a great uh, a great running mate there, and um, uh, was was someone who um, you know opened my eyes to a lot of things in the world that um, that he's probably arresting for people now. But um, in any case. Uh, it was a, a really dynamic and fantastic place to, to hang out. Um, and, to, and also, oh yeah, I was working there, right? So yes, to work out as well. Um, one of the things that we did, um, there's a, some pictures here of the, of the, of the ballpark, the, the Heights, um, uh, you have the Heights ball field. There's three great, uh, great images that you have. Um, one that um, really shows the ballpark, though, um, as it looks out. And um, I, I bring this up because you have one of people like in the early 1900s at the you know watching a ball game at uh, you know at the ballpark, and uh, this was the the scene of the uh, what was called the Cape Cod Bar Leagues, and this was a um, a, a really well known. I mean, it was it was uh, we, we got tons of people to come out to our games. 
um, and it was uh, a real, you know, it was kind of like you were, you were drinking while you were playing, of course, like most soft, softball is, but with the added extra push that this was actually the bars, all the, all the big bars in Falmouth had fielded teams. And it was a fairly big deal, you know. The, uh, the Enterprise would list um, capsules of, of the games, you know, next to the Commodore's games. They, they kept uh, listings of the standings. You know, they had photographs when teams won the championship. Um, and, uh, you know, I would always look. We'd always look in the capsules and read them next day and, and see where we were in the standings. But we played all over teams like a, a number of great Falmouth bars that no longer exist, you know, like the Yesterdays and the Casino uh, used, to have a t used to have a team. The, the Town Tavern actually had a very competitive team. They were usually a, a real good team. Captain Kidd had a team. The Landfall had a team. And then, you know, the Seacrest also had a, we had a, we had a team as well. And um, yeah, we played all over the place. Um, the, the one story that I would tell about the, about the ballpark here um, is, um, you know, is a, uh, a, a, a story. It's, it's, um, we were playing a game, and um, I, I think it was Brendan McCarthy who, who worked there as a waiter as well. Uh, his, uh, he was from North Falmouth. His, his uh, dad was part of the McCarthy ice cream, uh, McCarthy Brothers ice cream, which I think they, that, that doesn't exist anymore, but as a kid, I used to, used to think it was so cool that my classmates could just get ice cream whenever they wanted. Um, but anyway, he, uh, he, he must have, it must have been all that dairy that, uh, that helped him because he, he hit a shot uh, in a game once at the ball field that went all the way to what was then known as the Finish Line Tavern. Um, it was, uh, it's now no longer that. It's, um, and they rearranged the space. There's like a bar over there now, I think. I think it was the, um, a, a, beer, a beer joint for a while, and that place went out of business because I don't, it wasn't really good. Um, and then there's a new place there now. Um, but anyway, he hit a shot, and at that point, the kitchen was on that side facing the ball field. And uh, the ball went rocketing through them, and it was, a, it was just a rocket shot of a, of, a, of, a, of a home run that he hit. And it went blasting, just smashing through the window. Um, and uh, unfortunately, just spread glass like all over the kitchen, into all of the dishes, everybody's food, right? They had to obviously throw everything out, basically shut down for the afternoon. And the chef, um, you know, uh, in the, I, I, in the, in, we've all read uh, Anthony Bourdain's book, and, um, you know, especially in the 80s, um, speaking of all those, all those early vices, um, you know, the chefs were oftentimes um, under the influence of, of, certain, of certain things that made them a little agitated and excitable. And um, the chef, when his entire you know, meal service was destroyed for the afternoon, came running out of the, uh, the finish line tavern with his largest knife and uh, came chasing after poor Brendan McCarthy on the, you know, on the field. Fortunately, uh, cooler heads prevailed and uh, there, was, there was no damage. But um, when, uh, when we went back the next year for games, there was an iron gate over the, uh, over the window of the, <laughs> of, the, uh, you know, of, the, of the finish line tavern. So, uh, you know, those are the kind of some of the postcards I wanted to, to talk about and, and sort of also doing so, I, I would just like kind of say that, um, you know, this community of Falmouth, like we're talking about different communities in Falmouth, but really it's one community of Falmouth. It's, um, you know, it's, it's people that have, that are all sharing their lives together, that we're all participating in all of these, um, you know, fun activities together um, in these different institutions. Um, and... Um, you know, um, uh, families that have gone back for generations, uh, independent of if they were Portuguese or Cape Verdean or not, and, um, and all these people living all their lives together in this, in this really wonderful place. Um, I, I really love these postcards, and, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, great, a great treat and pleasure to have been able to, uh, to talk about some of, these, uh, some of these postcards with you. Thank you so much for coming with us.